My next guest is Emeritus Professor Ian Plymer. Professor Plymer is the nation's best known geologist, holder of several professional chairs in Australia and overseas, and the author of over 120 scientific papers, as well as at least 14 books for the general public, of which I have just ordered one, and I'm waiting for Connor Court to send it to me. They've already told me it's on its way. Welcome, Professor Plymer. Well, thank you for having me from the Connor Court offices in Brisbane. And you're from the Connor Court offices, and I can see uh, up to, on your uh, left, there's a, uh, one of your books, Green Murder. Yes, Green Murder on my left and on my right is um, a another book where I look at the energy that's required to make a spoon and behind me is my first substantial climate book and that's Heaven and Earth. And these can be acquired through uh, through uh, this company, ADH TV? Through Connor Court, yes. yes they and they go through to Connor Court. Yes, they publish a lot of conservative writings, a lot of religious writings, and they are one of the last outposts for publishing common sense. Yes. The major publishers now will not publish common sense. They've all gone woke. Yes. This is a very small family publisher, and they, they publish books that otherwise would not be published. And may I particularly recommend Green Murder. It's a very big book, but it's very thorough. I learned a lot from reading it in relation to the climate change hoax. Uh, Professor Plymer, you've had some very interesting correspondence with Prince Philip, the now deceased Duke of Edinburgh. What was that all about? <laughs> well, I had guessed his political views on climate change, and I would send every book that I wrote, and I've written six on climate, I would send them to the palace and he didn't get them. The mandarins uh, stopped him reading my works. And there was an occasion in London where I met an old Navy colleague of his, and this gentleman used to come and see Prince Philip, and they used to sit around and chat and maybe have a drink together. And I expressed my concern that none of my books were getting through. So I then used this gentleman as a conduit, and these books went through to the Duke of Edinburgh. And he then wrote back to me uh, talking about the nonsense of climate change and saying, well, when is it going to end? When are we going to stop spoiling our countryside with these dreadful wind turbine monstrosities? And uh, I was very pleased that he was able to read my books because um, the first couple of books I couldn't get through to him, but he certainly got green murder. Very good. Well, that is that is fascinating to to know that uh, they got through and uh, he was obviously very interested in them. Well, I suspect his daughter is of the same view and um, uh, the king is not. Well, they're entitled to their views, aren't they? So Yes, as I... long as they don't claim it's an informed view. <laughs> yes. And I must uh, congratulate you now on the success, speedy success, of your campaign concerning the Great Artesian Basin. That was uh, particularly successful. We're showing a, a map of it on the screen and it, the size of it is enormous in relation to Australia. Briefly, what was involved in that campaign? Well, the Great Artesian Basin occupies 22% of Australia. And the Great Artesian Basin is one of the great basins in the world which has got water in it and the water is from one particular unit called the Precipice Sandstone. And this water is very young water in the eastern side of the Great Artesian Basin. But by the time it's in South Australia and the far western side, that water is two million years old. Now, that water is used for stock. It's used for irrigation. It's used for thermal spring bathing, like in Moree or Lightning Ridge. And it's also used as potable water. Some of it is good enough to drink. So... Glencore, under pressure from the state and federal governments, was looking for a mechanism of disposing of carbon dioxide from power plants. And their idea was to liquefy this carbon dioxide under very, very high pressure and low temperature and put this underground into the precipice sandstone and where the liquid carbon dioxide would fill all the pores and it would be sequestered. Um, 
I joined many of the agricultural groups and many of the farmers' groups in saying, well, no, this is not a very good idea. The farmers were saying, well, look, this is going to change the chemistry of the water, which it would do, it would make the water slightly acid, and that would dissolve out cadmium and lead and um, some various toxic elements that are in the great artesian basin sediments, and once the water's acid, you get that into solution, and that would be used in irrigation and for stock, and they objected to it. They also objected to interfering with the aquifer. The aquifers had over 10,000 drill holes into it, and it's gone down quite considerably from overuse, but the aquifer is the lifeblood of agriculture in central and western Queensland. And so if you tamper with it, you're tampering with the livelihood of a very large number of people. But I looked at it a different way. We have two very good geological examples of carbon dioxide volcanoes. These are very recent. These are in the 80s. And one of them was Lake Neos in Cameroon. Lake Neos is an old volcanic crater. It's still exhaling carbon dioxide. And there was, on a quiet night, a sudden release of carbon dioxide from the Lake Neos sediments and bottom waters. And this explosively rose. It reached the surface. And because it was a still night and because carbon dioxide is heavier than air, this carbon dioxide filled the valleys. It killed 1,700 people because the carbon dioxide just pushed aside the air and there's no air to breathe. It killed about 3,500 stock. And this was exactly the situation that's being set up in the Great Artesian Basin, where geologists have a great interest in gas volcanoes, carbon dioxide volcanoes especially, because associated with them, there are very often gold deposits. And so we've studied these in great detail for decades, and carbon dioxide volcanoes are uh, quite catastrophic because if you expand the carbon dioxide, you get enormous breakage of the rocks and a massive eruption of gas and broken rock. Now, we know that we get leakage from the precipice sandstone because we have the mound springs in the western part of the Great Artesian Basin. This is where water is leaking up fractures. And if water can leak up the fractures, carbon dioxide can leak up the fractures. So my argument was that if you fill the precipice sandstone with liquid carbon dioxide under very high pressure, this can work its way up a crack, weaken the rock, explode and create a gas volcano and do exactly what happened at Lake Neos, is asphyxiate people and their livestock. And so I don't know whether that view really held sway, but there was massive opposition by farmers uh, to this measure and uh, it has been dropped. So I think I'm just one very small stitch uh, in, in, in the whole tapestry. Well, I remember reading your article on that in uh, Spectator and being astounded that uh, anybody would seriously consider such a proposal, but it's good that the Queensland Premier has announced that it's not going to go ahead. The, well, the, he's got an election coming. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't ever think that logic drives the system. It's an election. <laughs> That's probably true, yes. Now, uh, we're putting up the latest graphs from that marvellous lady, Jo Nova. They show that solar and wind are making a very small contribution to the world's energy, that traditional fuels dominate, and that man-made CO2 is increasing. Are you surprised? What effect will this have on the climate? Not at all. I'm not surprised. We've had a source of data for more than 100 years from BP, uh, British Petroleum. They now don't do it, but there's another group that does it. And that data is on where does our energy come from. Now, we've had for more than 100 years, more than 80% of the energy which we use for transport, for electricity, uh, that has come from fossil fuels. That's come from oil, that's come from gas, and that's come from coal. That has not changed for 100 years. And what has happened in that 100 years is we've had a warming and then we've had a cooling event, then we've had stasis. And so there is no relationship between the amount of fossil fuel we burn and what the temperature's been doing. And what has happened is that developing nations like China and like India and like Southeast Asia are burning more and more coal. That is because they want to end up with the same standard of living we have. And by burning that coal and by burning petroleum products and putting more and more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it has not had 
a single effect on the climate. There has been no climate change. Now, many scientists are very much aware that carbon dioxide does not drive climate change. And for decades, I've been asking the so-called climate scientists, who are really activists, but asking them, can you please give me just half a dozen landmark scientific papers demonstrating that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming? Now, I've just had obfuscation. They have never, ever given me anything to show that human emissions drive climate change. And if they did, they'd have to show that the natural emissions, which are 97% of the total, don't drive climate change. They would have to show that all of chemistry of the solution of carbon dioxide and water is wrong. They'd have to also show that the ice core drilling, showing that after a temperature rise, you get a carbon dioxide rise, which is the opposite of what being, we're being told, they'd have to show that. So. Um, Joe Nova is absolutely correct. There is absolutely no effect on climate. We've had a massive increase in carbon dioxide emissions. But um, what we also know is that if you increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, then there's more that dissolves in the oceans. There is an equilibrium. There's a balance between the atmosphere and the oceans. So um, I have argued for a long time that the whole exercise of sequestering carbon dioxide by having green energy is totally and absolutely futile. We cannot change major planetary systems by just turning one dial. I think in uh, your book, Green Murder, one of the things that stands out in my mind is where you wrote that, uh, I think, in the history of this planet, there have been six ice ages, and at the beginning of every ice age, there was far more CO2 in the atmosphere than today. This is the beginning of the ice age. Uh, yeah. The logic should be, should it not, that uh, these should have started global warming to a massive degree. Well, when you're a political activist, logic is not used. Um, <laughs> but the... Uh, couple of early great ice ages where we covered the planet in ice. The whole planet was covered in ice. We had um, two periods of time when we had kilometres of ice at sea level, at the equator, yet we had carbon dioxide about 500 times higher than it is now in the atmosphere. So if carbon dioxide is meant to drive a runaway global warming, then the evidence from the past doesn't show that this is the case. And in any science, uh, this is called the coherence criterion in science, that if you're putting up a theory, it has to be in accord with all the other theories from the other disciplines of science. So if you, as an atmospheric physicist, are putting up a theory that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming and that an increase in, of carbon dioxide will give you warming, then that's not in accord with what we know from the past. And that has been validated many, many times, so you have to reject the theory that human emissions of carbon dioxide drive global warming. That's not done. We don't use the scientific method. We don't use logic. This is an activist activity that is trying to uh, stop industrialisation. It's trying to make our life more difficult. And we see today where we've got massive objections to our leader of the opposition suggesting that we should actually have seven nuclear power plants. And all the green enterprises are putting out an SOS call. Now, this is not because they have got any technical objections to nuclear power. The SOS is save our subsidies. They can see that their <laughs> subsidies are being threatened and there's no such thing as renewable energy. The only thing renewable about renewable energy are the subsidies. So we've got all of those uh, with a dog in the fight now really objecting to Mr Dutton um, suggesting that we do what the other G20 countries have done, we do uh, what many other countries have done in the world, and that is underpin our base load power with nuclear energy. Professor Ian Blimer, I think I should really thank you for what you're doing and what you have done, for saving. I think yours was the, the significant point that uh, saved the great artesian basin, because I don't think many people realised what was going on until your article appeared. And uh, I must thank you for and hope that you will continue your campaign in relation to the exaggerated view that one small component of our atmosphere controls everything, which seems to me to be ridiculous. Thank you so well, much. Well, thank you for giving me the airtime. 
thank you for letting me talk in public because most other networks will not let logic and common sense be espoused. You're so right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ian you.